of the Dade County Homicide Squad are partners with the dope dealers. Our story goes beyond that first FBI disclosure. Our I-team report, The Cocaine Cops, with Joe Bergantino and Clarence Jones, raises a number of chilling questions about Dade County law enforcement. When the FBI agents began their searches last month, they were looking for records that would more closely tie policemen to dope smugglers. They weren't looking for murder. They were surprised at what they found. Our sources say the FBI discovered confidential files from the county homicide squad in the hands of cocaine smugglers. That find raises frightening possibilities. Homicide files on unsolved murders are highly confidential. Even other policemen are not allowed to see them unless they prove a need to know. The files will tell you what the police know and what they don't know about a murder. They would give a killer an opportunity to build a better alibi. The files would also disclose witnesses and what they know. Providing that kind of information to the dopers is almost an invitation to kill a dangerous witness. The records the FBI discovered in the smugglers' hands were almost certainly provided by members of the Dade County Homicide Squad. Fingering a witness to be killed is only one step away from pulling the trigger yourself. Rumors that policemen are involved in dope killings have been floating through the local law enforcement community for months. One agency went back and reviewed every drug-related murder in its files, looking for clues that would point to police officers as assassins. A prominent defense attorney, with the same suspicion, went to a judge to discuss his concern. One case under scrutiny by both the FBI and the Dade County State Attorney's Office now is the murder of Edward T. Forcer, a black millionaire heroin smuggler shot in his home here two months ago. Joe Bergantino has details on Forcer's heroin operation. The morning of May 24, 1979, Edward Forcer was under arrest. The Justice Department was charging him with running one of the largest heroin gangs in the Southeast United States. It was a well-established operation. Starting almost 12 years ago, the Forcer heroin ring had set up supply lines to smuggle cocaine from Colombia and trade it for Mexican heroin. The gang dealed in so much dope it had to use large donut mixing machines like these to cut their heroin. Sales totaled as much as three million dollars a month. 34 men and women were eventually indicted in connection with Forcer's organization. They included two police sergeants, Daniel Bailey of the City of Miami Force and Robert Spicer of the County Public Safety Department. Bailey was charged with taking bribes to allow street sales of the gang's heroin. Spicer was charged with more direct involvement in the gang including the bagging and selling of heroin. Bailey and Spicer were the only two policemen arrested last May, but a Newswatch investigation has learned that at least six other policemen are suspects in the Forcer investigation. The Forcer case was a joint police project. Agents from the Federal Drug Enforcement Agency, the FBI, Dade County, City of Miami and Miami Beach, and the Florida Department of Law Enforcement worked together for two years on this case. The gang was under almost constant surveillance. The government filed its first indictment against Forcer's operation in May. But the Justice Department apparently had more evidence it didn't include in the first indictment. By late summer, a new federal grand jury was meeting to hear additional evidence in the Forcer case. Evidence that would be used to draw up a new indictment. An indictment that would possibly name even more policemen. But on the night of September 30th, there was a new development in the Forcer case. Edward Forcer was murdered. The government has told the judge hearing the drug ring case that the murder has, and I quote, had no small consequence upon the presentation of evidence before the new grand jury. That means either Forcer's murder has frightened the grand jury witnesses or that Forcer was about to talk. There are several unusual things about Edward Forcer's murder and the way Dade County homicide detectives have handled the investigation. Clarence has more on that story. This is the house where Forcer lived at 9140 Northwest 13th Avenue. He had turned it into a fortress. Guns everywhere, burglar bars, alarms, floodlights, closed circuit TV systems to scan the front of the house. The front door had an inside iron gate. It was never open for strangers. Forcer's body was found in the foyer of the house. It was not a swift, clean killing. He had been handcuffed, his hands behind his back. He was a big man, 
If he had fought, it would probably have taken more than one man to cuff him. There is an unusual aspect to the handcuffing. The wrists had been twisted palms out. It's not easy to cuff a man that way. Most people would put the cuffs on palms together. But policemen learn to do it the hard way, palms out. It makes your prisoner more helpless. Inside the front door, it appears he was forced to kneel. He was pistol whipped in the face. He was shot in the leg three times, perhaps one shot at a time to extend the pain. The gun was a 22 caliber automatic equipped with a silencer. The neighbors would not have heard anything. Two shots in the left ear finished the job. The house was not ransacked. The killers closed the front door as they left, leaving it unlocked. When the victim is as notorious as Edward Forcer, normally the homicide detectives would become extremely meticulous. They would collect even the tiniest shreds of evidence and run them through chemical analysis. They would look for everybody they could find who knew the victim and then interview them sometimes over and over again. Those basic police procedures were not followed in this case. And the people investigating corruption within the county homicide squad are trying now to find out why. Unusual item number one. The night Edward Forster was murdered, there were several pieces of paper in his pocket with names and telephone numbers on them. Usually, homicide detectives would remove those papers from the body at the scene to examine them for clues or evidence. But in this case, that didn't happen. Those papers were still in Forcer's pocket when federal drug enforcement agents viewed the body after it arrived here at the county morgue. Unusual item number two. Some of the people who knew Forcer best have never been questioned by homicide detectives. They include his lawyers. They have never been interviewed. Local detectives who got to know Forcer, his habits and his friends during their long two-year investigation. They were not interviewed either. Unusual item number three. Those detectives thought that was very strange. So they let the homicide squad know they were available and might be able to help solve the murder. But they still haven't been called. The most unusual item of all. There's a safe in Forcer's house. That's where informers say he kept a ledger book with a record of police payoffs. Normally, the crime lab technician at the scene would have routinely opened that safe. But the night of Edward Forcer's murder, that didn't happen. The homicide detectives decided it wasn't necessary. When the crime lab technicians left the scene, the safe was still locked. We brought our questions about the Forcer murder investigation to the captain of the Dade County Homicide Unit. Some witnesses who have knowledge about Forcer's life and activity still have not been questioned. Is that unusual? I wouldn't be able to comment at this time because I'm not familiar with uh, the particulars and what was done or not done in that particular case. Would it be unusual to not go through the pockets of the victim and bag the, whatever is in those pockets at the scene of the crime? It could be, depending on the circumstances. I would really be unable to comment at this time. Would it be unusual not to open a safe when you have a victim as notorious as Forcer? It could be, but like I said, I would be unable to comment at this time as under investigation. Tomorrow night, we'll take a look at another possible motive for the killing of Edward Forcer. For Clarence Jones, I'm Joe Bergantino with the Newswatch 10 I-Team. Seven Dade County homicide detectives have been subpoenaed today by a federal grand jury there to be questioned about the unsolved murder of heroin dealer Edward T. Forcer. The grand jury also subpoenaed all Dade County Public Safety Department records in that murder investigation. Last night, the Newswatch I team disclosed in an exclusive report that the FBI is expanding its investigation of corruption within the Dade County Homicide Squad. We also disclosed the Forcer murder is a focal point in that federal probe. The I team, Clarence Jones and Joe Bergantino, tonight has another exclusive report on that corruption investigation. And Clarence, I guess it's been a, a busy, busy day for you. For a lot of people in this case, a lot of people. The Forster case is heating up considerably. In addition to the grand jury subpoenas today, there is new activity within the homicide squad and at the state attorney's office. We showed you last night that the search of Forster's home and his pockets missed several things. Last Friday, as part of our investigation, we obtained permission from the custodian of Forster's house to go inside that empty house. The floor safe that has become one of the major points in this case was still there on Friday. 
our camera failed, so we went back to the house to shoot pictures last Monday. The safe was gone. There was an empty hole in the concrete floor where the safe had been. The next day, on Tuesday, the state attorney's staff obtained a search warrant for the Forcer house. They returned to the scene of the two-month-old murder with crime lab technicians to try to collect evidence that was overlooked the night of the killing. But by Tuesday, the safe was no longer there. The removal of the safe over the weekend raises the possibility that there was a leak, and someone in the Forcer organization decided to dispose of the safe before the police came back. At the Homicide Squad, a new lead investigator has been assigned to the Forcer case to give it a fresh workup. Tonight, we've learned through our investigation that the Forcer murder may also have involved the theft of more than half a million dollars. Joe Bergantino has details on that. If there was one powerful element in the life of Edward T. Forcer, it was money. As one of the biggest dope dealers in this part of the country, he was a millionaire. He kept more money in his home than most of us would ever make in a lifetime. Money that could have been a motive for his murder, or maybe the reason for a sloppy homicide investigation. Forster kept a lot of his money in a floor safe, here in the garage of his house. The night he was murdered, our sources say crime lab technicians at the scene argued the safe should be opened. Homicide detectives said there was no need to open it. The crime lab thought that was unusual. We've now learned there were several reasons to open it. Informers in his narcotics gang say that's where Edward Forster kept a ledger book of police payoffs. Word of the ledger book is one reason the FBI and the Dade County State Attorney's Office are investigating the Forster case. Forster's payoffs raise the suspicion that a crooked policeman might have killed Forster to protect himself from discovery. We have talked to several members of the Forster gang who say there was about $650,000 in the safe that night Forster was killed. They claim the police looted the safe that when the house was turned back over to Forcer's brother 10 hours after the homicide, the safe appeared intact, but that when the brother opened it, there was only $25,000 in it. The gang members believe that a thief would have taken everything. They believe a policeman would have left some money in the safe to cover his theft. Clarence continues the story. You should understand that people in the Forcer organization are not the most reliable witnesses. They could have taken the money after the police left. They don't like policemen, and they have every reason to hurt them. But the nasty question of the failure to open the safe and make that safe and its contents part of the evidence in this case still hangs there. Homicide told us late yesterday they did not open the safe because an assistant state attorney told them the night of the murder that they had no legal grounds to open it. We pursued that today. On the night of the killing, assistant state attorney Jeff Raffle was on call. Homicide called him, woke him up, told him they had another drug-related murder. There were 21 murders in Dade County that month. Raffle was told that night the body had not been identified and there did not appear any reason for him to come to the scene. Early the next morning, less than 12 hours after the body was found, Homicide turned the house over to Forcer's brother, who was his co-defendant in the federal drug case. After the brother took possession of the house, Homicide met with another assistant state attorney, Jim Woodard. Homicide says it asked Woodard for a search warrant to open the safe. Woodard says he has no memory of any conversation about a safe, but it could have happened. Whatever was said, the safe by then had probably lost its value as evidence. The police had lost custody. We tested the story of $650,000 being inside the safe on several law enforcement officers who were familiar with Forcer's drug operation. All said that figure is completely believable. He was dealing in so much dope he needed between a half million and a million dollars in cash all the time. The dope community knew that, and many policemen knew that. But nobody knows now what happened to the cash. The evidence report from the murder scene shows no money was found in Forcer's house. With Joe Bergantino, I'm Clarence Jones for the Newswatch 10 I-Team. Tonight, suspended Dade Commissioner Neil Adams is in trouble again. He was arrested at the federal courthouse in downtown Miami, and a member of the News Watch 10 I team was there to witness it. Adams had been subpoenaed by a federal grand jury, which today opened a new investigation into the murder of heroin kingpin Edward Forcer, a murder the News Watch I team has been investigating. TV 10 investigative reporter Clarence Jones was the only reporter on the scene when Adams was arrested. I walked through those glass doors just as two security officers shoved Adams against a vending machine. They handcuffed his hands behind his back, and Officer Kenneth Brown then held him by the handcuffs up and led him upstairs to a small cell block 
where U.S. Marshals keep their prisoners before they're taken to court. All the way down the hall, Adams kept saying, I've got to go to the grand jury. I've got to go to the grand jury. Inside the cell block, his pockets were emptied, and then Brown unloaded the revolver. It was a small, 32 caliber, six-shot, blue steel revolver, a hammerless model, a Saturday night special. When Brown shoved the cylinder out to unload it, the entire cylinder fell out on the desk. It had five shells in it. Adams had come through a rear door of the building where a new construction is underway. He was probably trying to avoid reporters and photographers. When the security officers saw him come out of the construction area, they told him he would have to go through a metal detector, which was installed because of security problems in the current Black Tuna Gang drug smuggling case. The machine detected the pistol in his pocket, and he was quickly arrested, charged with carrying a firearm into a federal courthouse. Within an hour, Adams was taken before a federal magistrate who released him on a $50,000 personal surety bond. That is unusually high for the charge, considering Adams' status as a public official. An assistant U.S. attorney said there were circumstances he could not disclose that require a high bond. Adams was suspended from the Dade Commission after he was arrested for pocketing the proceeds of bingo games he ran for charity. Just before his federal magistrate's hearing today, Adams was taken by a U.S. Marshal to the grand jury room on the third floor of the courthouse. He was inside the room a very short time, which may indicate that he took the Fifth Amendment and refused to testify. That grand jury today opened a federal investigation into the September 30th murder of Edward T. Forcer. Earlier this week, we reported that the federal investigation of narcotics corruption within the Dade County Public Safety Department is focusing on Forcer's murder and the less than thorough investigation of that killing by the Dade Homicide Squad. Forcer ran one of the largest heroin smuggling operations in the southern United States. Our sources say the Forcer investigation turned up some kind of business association between Forcer and Adams. The grand jury also called seven public safety department officers who have some connection to the Forcer case. The first group of detectives who arrived at the federal courthouse were those originally assigned to investigate the drug killing. William Bellardine, Steve Jackson, Richard Mueller, and Pedro Izagari. As we reported last night, a new team of investigators has now been assigned and the case has been given top priority by the Dade State Attorney. The jury today called Lou Dysadu, a homicide supervisor, Richard Wolf, assigned last week as new lead investigator, and Tom Carroll, the crime lab technician who thought it strange the night of the murder that the detectives did not want to open a floor safe in Forcer's house. Informers said Forcer kept a ledger book of police payoffs in that safe. Forcer normally would also have had more than half a million dollars in cash in the safe. Clarence Jones, Newswatch 10, I-Team. This is the case of Armando Fiallo. Fiallo was a small-time cocaine dealer. He had served time in both federal and state prisons for dealing dope. On the afternoon of December 5, 1978, three homicide detectives searched Fiallo's house here on Southwest 64th Place. They did not have a warrant for the search. They found cocaine, marijuana, guns, and a lot of money. How the police got through this door will become an issue in this case. The amount of money they found inside and seized is also disputed. At least $62,000, perhaps as much as $98,000. Whatever the amount, the money is now missing, and the three detectives who arrested Fiallo are under investigation in the disappearance of that cash. One week after the arrest, Fiallo and his 22-year-old girlfriend were murdered in this house. She was shot in the face. Fiallo was shot a number of times in the body. With Fiallo dead, the money that had been seized just one week before was no longer evidence. His murder closed that case. The disappearance of his money opens another one. Joe Bergantino will tell you about the three arresting officers. The three officers who arrested Fiallo and seized his money were Julio Ojeda, Charles Zetropelic, and Robert Derringer. Last month, Ojeda and Zetropelic were among four county homicide detectives suspended after the FBI announced they were under investigation. The FBI says it has prosecutable evidence the officers had become partners with local cocaine dealers. That in return for money and gifts, they were systematically harassing, arresting, and robbing the dealer's competitors. The third officer who arrested Armando Fiallo and seized his money, Robert Derringer, is still on duty. Derringer has not been publicly named as a target in the FBI's investigation, but he is now a key figure in another investigation. 
to find out who took Armando Fiallo's money. December 5, 1978. According to their arrest report, Ojeda, Zetra Pelic, and Derringer were looking for a murder suspect. They say they had a tip he was hiding in Fiallo's house. According to their report, they knocked on Fiallo's door. This is how they describe what happened. And I quote, Mr. Fiallo allowed these officers entrance to his residence. As we were looking for the suspect in plain view was a controlled substance. In the closet, there was large quantities of marijuana. End of quote. Item number one. The attorneys for the Fiallo family say he would never have let three policemen in if there was cocaine in plain sight. Item number two. There is no mention in the arrest report of any money being seized. There is this receipt, though, that indicates that close to $63,000 of Fiallo's money was seized in the arrest and kept in the police property room. The day before officers Ojeda and Zetropelic were suspended, the Fiallo family's attorneys suddenly learned that Fiallo's money was no longer in the public safety department's property room. How the money left the property room is a very unusual story. Clarence has more on that. This receipt, dated April 11th, shows the release of $62,735 to a Carlos Fernandez. The Miami Telephone Directory lists as many Carlos Fernandez's as John Smith's. The address shown for Carlos Fernandez is completely fictitious. In that section of Southwest Dade County, there is no 27th Terrace. The receipt shows Fernandez as Fiallo's next of kin. His identity and the family relationship were certified by Detective Derringer. The Fiallo family says it has never heard of Carlos Fernandez. Fiallo was divorced. His former wife, the mother of his 13-year-old son, hired a law firm to recover the money that had been seized by the police. They went to probate court in February, filing this will and establishing that the son, Armando Jr., was Fiallo's next of kin and sole legal heir. When the lawyers could find no record of any money being seized from Fiallo, they tried to reach Officer Ojeda. Well, I think Mr. Essen, who made the attempts to reach Officer Ojeda, tried uh, probably five, six, seven times. These were telephone calls? Telephone calls. Which were not returned? That's right, which was not really unusual because Officer Ojeda was a busy officer. Now, you finally reach him in July. What does he tell you when you contact him in person about the money? He said that he had found some $62,000 and turned the money in, and that he had no objection to the boy getting the money back. He indicated that the money was still there in July? That's correct. The mother and son have become so frightened since Fiallo's murder, they would only talk to us through their attorney. How much money did the boy say the father had in the house? Several weeks before the father was arrested, he had shown the son uh, a briefcase containing $98,000, and they had discussed the fact that the money was for the son's future and his education. Does anyone else know about the money? Did the father talk to anyone else about that? After his arrest, uh, Armando Fiallo Sr. told uh, his son's mother, uh, wh whom he was divorced from, uh, that the $98,000 had been seized and that had been for the son. From July, when the lawyers first contacted Ojeda, through September, when they talked to him again, they say Ojeda led them to believe that at least $62,000 of Fiallo's money was still stored in the county property room. In November of 1979, my partner talked to Officer Ojeda, and it was then for the first time he told us that the money had been turned over to a relative in April. Now, you had talked to him at, on at least two occasions after April. That's correct. When he gave no indication that the money had been recovered by anyone else? That's correct. Does anyone in the family know Carlos Fernandez? I have asked both the mother and the son, and neither of them have any knowledge of Carlos Fernandez. They know no one by that name? That's correct. There is no one in the family by that name? Not to their knowledge. We tried to talk to the homicide detectives involved in the FIO arrest. Clarence went to Julio Ojeda's house. Who is it? Clarence Jones from Channel 10. I'd like to speak to Julio Ojeda. Nobody would open the door. I visited Charles Zetropelic's home. Nobody would answer the door there either. Who is it? My name is Joe Bergantino from Channel 10. I'm sorry, 
We asked Metro Public Information Officer George Lucas to arrange an interview with Detective Robert Derringer. He said he'd convey the message. Lucas told us the FIO case is under investigation by the department's internal review section. I can tell you that uh, we received it about two and a half weeks ago, and it is progressing along. In a short time, we hope to have some type of final conclusion on it. What about the men who run the police property room? We asked them if any extra precautions are taken when large amounts of money are released. Do you still only need one signature, one officer? You don't need any kind of counter check on that? No, as long as he's the investigating officer involved in the case. You would release it just on his say-so? Right. We intend to file suit against the county for improperly turning over uh, monies belonging to our client. Do you think you'll win? I believe we have an excellent case. With Clarence Jones, I'm Joe Bergantino of the Newswatch 10 I team. The four Dade County homicide detectives who were suspended last month were officially notified today that they were over here heard on a number of bugs and wiretaps the FBI used to monitor local drug smugglers' activities. The Newswatch I team today confirmed the electronic intercepts as part of the federal investigation of narcotics corruption within the Dade Public Safety Department. There are a number of other new developments today in the case of the cocaine cops. I-Team reporter Clarence Jones is here in the studio to tell you about them. Clarence? Thank you, Ann. The federal law that permits electronic eavesdropping with court authorization also says you must give official notice to everyone whose voice is picked up on those bugs and taps. The FBI today began that official notification process, serving papers on 25 people who have been identified on the tapes so far. FBI Special Agent in Charge Arthur Nerboss emphasizes that the notification process is only beginning. Many more people will be notified before the case is finished. The FBI will not say how many devices were planted, but they give some idea of how many conversations were overheard. There are now 20 stenographers busy transcribing taped voices. If they continue to work full time, it will take them another two months just to type what was overheard. Nearboss confirmed that among the first 25 people notified are suspended homicide detectives Julio Ojeda, Charles Zatrapelic, Fabio Alonso, and George Pontigo. There were several new developments today in the search for nearly $100,000 that disappeared after three homicide detectives arrested cocaine dealer Armando Fiallo last December. We told you earlier this week how homicide detectives Ojeda, Zatrapelic, and Robert Derringer arrested Fiallo and seized a briefcase full of money. One week later, Fiallo and his 22-year-old girlfriend were murdered. Fiallo's money was then released to a Carlos Fernandez with a fictitious address. The authorization for that next-of-kin release was endorsed by Detective Derringer. The family does not know a Carlos Fernandez. The Public Safety Department's internal affairs investigation has now been expanded to include the FBI and the Dade State Attorney's Office. I think the risk you run in procedurally if you proceed on administrative matters the possibility could exist of immunizing or jeopardizing any criminal prosecution. So at the stage we're at now, I think it's more appropriate that we go to prosecuting authorities or federal agencies to continue and assist us in the investigation. In our earlier story, we showed that large amounts of seized money can be released by the Public Safety Department with the approval of only one investigating officer. Do you see a need to change the procedure for releasing property as a result of this investigation? I think there's no question about that. I think that uh, because of the nature of the problems we're having in Dade County and the large seizures of money, that procedurally we have to require some authorization by supervisory personnel. So part of it as a result of the findings on this investigation is to strengthen and tighten that procedure, and that's probably the first steps that we need to be taking. How soon can that be done? It can be done uh, probably in a matter of days. The shadow on the integrity of some Dade homicide detectives is having a serious effect on morale and casework within that squad. Because the investigation continues to expand, Berticelli said he cannot predict when it will end. I'm Clarence Jones, Newswatch 10, I-Team.